Christian Heritage Ministry, in cooperation with Fuller Seminary, proudly presents the Old Fashioned Revival Hour, a broadcast of the Gospel with Dr. Charles E. Fuller. Please and sing Heavenly Sunshine. 
This is one of the features of the old-fashioned revival hour to have a time of fellowship here at the Long Beach Municipal Auditorium. As you sing through the first time, give as many as possible a good handshake and a good Long Beach welcome. Now all together, really lift it out. Heavenly sunshine. Turn right around, give everybody a good handshake. Plenty of sunlight, especially after the quartet singing that old familiar song, Sunlight, Sunlight. And now we want heavenly sunshine. We want the real full glory of the Lord's presence, Jesus, the light of the world. Once more now, really lift it up. Heavenly soloist on that lovely number, If I Gain the World. Onward, Christian soldiers, marching as to the Lord, with the cross of Jesus going on before. Christian soldiers marching as to the war with the cross of Jesus going on before Christ the royal master leads against 
Before Mrs. Fuller reads from the letters, may I make this announcement for the friends in the East. Lord willing, Mrs. Fuller and I will be in Convention Hall in Philadelphia. We'll be there in a great campaign, closing campaign with Merv Rosell, well-known national evangelist. So, you friends in the East, 
Honey and I'll be glad to say hello, won't we? Oh, All right, go right ahead and lead, read the letter. Greetings, friends. A young man at Samson Air Force Base in New York writes a good letter. He's been in the service six years, and only in February this year did he really come to know Christ as his Savior after listening to the old-fashioned revival hour one Sunday afternoon. Now everything is different, and he has joy and peace. And his parents also wrote, saying how happy they are to have their prayers of many years answered. Dear Dr. Fuller, I feel that you are a real friend to us. We have heard your voice over the air for so many years. Since November the 3rd, it has been a time of greatest testing for my husband and me. Since our 15-year-old son was struck and killed while walking along the highway only a half a mile from home. Just two days before the accident, his daddy was driving him to school and they had a talk. And our Gordy told his father that he really knew he was saved. He was ready to meet the Lord any time he might be called. That has been a great comfort to us, and we feel this is his gain, though so hard for us to bear. The old-fashioned revival hour that we've all heard together for so long is also a great comfort to us. And then this last letter is from New York. Dear Mr. Fuller, yesterday a friend sent me a picture of you and baby Janice in the Heart to Heart talk. I said, hello, I know you, grandfather, for I've listened for over two years every Sunday morning. She's a beautiful baby and a pearl of great price. And may God hold her in the hollow of his hand always. Words cannot tell you what the hour means to many people here in the East. My husband and I are old and poor in this world's goods, but we have enough for our needs, and I just want to help even a little to send the good news around the world. I've been a Christian since childhood, and God has been so merciful in his great love toward me. But when things get too bad, I just start humming Heavenly Sunshine, and soon I am singing it, and then there is a warm glow in my heart, and then I can go bravely on. Your Bible teaching is so clear, and it helps so much to understand what God expects of his children. And that is all I shall have time for today, friends. and sing two verses of number 137. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. I felt constrained today to have you sing this song because there's so many that are going through deep trials, many going through the valley of the shadow of death. We want them to know that the Lord is near and not to fear any evil, for Christ will be their shepherd and their friend. Truly there's no friend like the lowly Jesus. Sing in the Spirit now, everyone taking part. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No
we bow our heads in prayer. Our Father, we thank thee for the Lord Jesus today who can be touched with the feeling of our infirmity, tested in all points like as we are yet without sin. And we thank thee that we have one who stands by, our comforter, our advocate. And we pray that thou wilt speak peace and comfort to all the troubled hearts, And like the sea of Galilee that was in high waves and the little boat and those in the boat about to perish, thou didst speak peace and there was a great calm. Jesus, the friend of sinners today, speak peace to hearts that are hardened, that need thee as as their Savior. And then speak comfort and peace to the troubled hearts that are already members of the body of Christ, and truly may we sit in heavenly places today, and may Christ have the preeminence in all that we do, for we ask it in his name. Amen.
listening to the Old Fashioned Revival Hour with Dr. Charles E. Fuller. His message for today is the Spirit-Filled Life. Open your Bibles to the book of Ephesians, chapter 5, verse 18, as we rejoin the broadcast. I'll provide additional information after Dr. Fuller's message. I wandered in the shades of night till Jesus came to me, and with the sunlight of his love did all my darkness be. Sunlight, sunlight in my soul today, sunlight, sunlight all along the way. Since the Savior found me, took away my sin, I have had the sunlight of his love within. Soon I shall see him as he is, the light that came to me. Behold the brightness of his face throughout eternity. Sunlight, sunlight in my soul today. Sunlight, sunlight all along the way. Since the Savior found me, took away my sin. I have had the sunlight of his love with me. Though clouds may gather in the sky and billows round me roll, however dark the world may be, I've sunlight in my soul. Sunlight, sunlight in my soul today. Sunlight, sunlight all along the way. Since the Savior found me, took away my sin. I have heard the sunlight of his love with Bibles and turn again to the fifth chapter of Ephesians, beginning at the eighteenth verse. And be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. The solution to all your problems will be found in the latter part of that eighteenth verse. But be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. I want to just speak to you very briefly today on the Spirit-filled life <clears throat> and how we need to know, how we need to know and to appropriate every gracious spiritual provision that God has for us in Christ Jesus. And when we do know and appropriate what God has for us, it enables us to walk pleasing in his sight, to be fruitful under every good work, and to be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. First of all, may I give you just a word of personal testimony. After my conversion, it will be 35 years next July, God gave me a great love for the souls of men and a burning desire to preach the gospel to every creature. Not being fully taught in the word about God's provision to be filled with the Spirit, the days of my early ministry were marked by a great deal of self-effort and my trying to do the Lord's work in my own strength. God's very patient with us. 
However, I soon realized that though I might speak with the tongues of men and of angels and not be filled with the Holy Spirit or have the Spirit of Christ, I would be a sounding brass or tinkling cymbal. My work would be of the hay, wood, and stubble type, not lasting, not fruitful, but barren, having a form of godliness but no power. I began to search God's word very diligently, search this precious word upon such passages as Zechariah 4, 6, where it says, Not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. And then when I read such passages in Ephesians 1, 18, or 19 and 20, where it speaks of the greatness or the exceeding greatness of God's power to us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand. The thought came to me, here's a source of power far beyond anything that this world knows of. And if we individually are in right relationship and fellowship with God and filled with the Holy Spirit, that power then it would be God working through us, he accomplishing his purpose through us. And at that time, I began to hunger and thirst after righteousness, praying to be filled, to be empowered, and to be a channel for God to use. Fortunately or unfortunately, depending upon one's viewpoint, I was taught that unless I had some special manifestation of the Holy Spirit, such as speaking in tongues, I was not sealed by the Holy Spirit. In other words, I did not have the Holy Spirit. God was very patient with me, long-suffering. And finally it came to me like a flash of lightning from the glory above that I personally was to yield to present my body as a living sacrifice and let the already indwelling Holy Spirit fill me, then the Holy Spirit unfolded to me his gift for me. And I found that that gift simply was to be evangelistic in my teaching of the word. And since that day, for thirty-some four years, I've tried to be obedient to the heavenly vision. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. And he loves to take the weak things and the foolish things to confound the wise. And so I want to give you some very simple teaching on this broadcast of the Old Fashioned Revival Hour, on the place and work of the Holy Spirit. And my earnest prayer is this, that you, fellow believers, May not only leave this visible audience, but leave your radio at the close of this broadcast truly filled with the Holy Spirit. May God grant it. Take your Bibles and turn to the 14th chapter of the Gospel of John, beginning at the 16th verse. The Lord was at the Last Supper. Calvary was just ahead. And he had his disciples seated with him around the table. He was speaking to his disciples, and he said, I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. And then the 26th verse. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. The 16th chapter of the Gospel of John, verses 7 and 8. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away, for if I go away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment to come. 
And in the remaining chapters of the Gospel of John, we have the record of the crucifixion of Christ, where he became sin, bearing our sins in his own body on the tree. And then, upon the first day of the week, the resurrection from among the dead. And then, forty days, how he walked with his disciples. And then, according to the first chapter of Acts, he was taken up into glory. This Jesus, this same Jesus, was suddenly taken up into glory. And then, ten days later, the Holy Spirit, according to Acts, the second chapter, came. Now, let me drive this home to you, that you do not have to pray for the Holy Spirit to come down from heaven. He is here doing his threefold work, according to John 16. And now follow me carefully. This Holy Spirit, the moment that a soul hears the gospel and becomes reconciled through the blood of Christ and made nigh by the blood of Christ, his body becomes the temple of the Holy Spirit. For 1 Corinthians 6.19 says, Know ye not? that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And then furthermore, according to Romans 8, 9, Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. The point is this, that every unsaved person in this world is completely, utterly devoid of the Holy Spirit. There's not even a spark of divinity in you. You are none of his alienated and cut off from the life that is in Christ Jesus. All men by nature are so alienated and cut off. But upon receiving Christ as personal Savior, the soul becomes a new creation, and the Holy Spirit immediately takes up his dwelling place and indwells the newborn believer. He has the Holy Spirit, but he may not be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, sometimes, and I've seen it happen frequently, sometimes at the time of conversion, a soul will completely yield his life and will yield himself unto God and fully present himself as a living sacrifice and then and there, at conversion, become filled with the Holy Spirit and to begin to grow in grace immediately, spiritually minded, and begin to bring forth fruit and more fruit and much fruit, and to grow in grace overnight. However, some at the time of conversion, not being fully taught or instructed in the Word, perhaps saved, but their lives are lives of almost daily a defeat, living upon the plane of self-effort, endeavoring by their own strength to walk pleasing in God's sight. And these may remain babes in Christ, able only to grasp the simple teachings of God's Word and desiring the sincere milk of the Word, never being able to take the meat of the Word, the deeper things of the Word. Now, God's desire is that all believers be filled with the Holy Spirit, and to be like Stephen, like the early church deacons, men of honest report, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom. And I stop and say to you, if you're a member of the body of Christ, living on a low level, carnal, full of division and envy and strife, full of the things of the plane of the self-life, You are a defeated believer and not realizing what God has for you in Christ Jesus. And the norm, the standard that God has set before us is this, that every one of us, naming the name of Christ, be filled with the Holy Spirit. And the moment that you're filled with the Holy Spirit, it will solve all of your spiritual problems and difficulties. Oh, I know, some of you don't care the snap of your fingers what I'm talking about. You're satisfied just to be saved as though by fire. God have mercy on you. With no fruit, 
hay, wood, and stubble being burned up at the judgment seat of Christ with no eternal abiding work or fruit to present to the Lord that has done so much for you. God stir you up and may you begin to hunger and thirst after righteousness. And when you do come to the place of yielding and presenting your body as a living sacrifice, then you will bring forth the fruit of the Spirit. Listen, love, I'm not talking about human relationship. The love that we have for our loved one on the plane of human affection. I'm talking about love, God's love shed abroad in your heart. The love for the unlovely, the love that will cause you to go down to the very lowest place of social level and win those that are sunken deep in sin. That love that conquers everything according to 1 Corinthians 13. Joy, peace, you have peace with God the moment that you are saved, but this speaks of a deeper peace. Peace under all circumstances. The peace of God that passes all understanding. For God says, I'll keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on the Lord. Not only love and joy and peace, but long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance or self-control. And how we need the fruit of the Spirit. Now test yourself. Any of you that know the orange business will know that the Valencia orange always has nine segments, and yet it's one. And you name these over and you'll find there are nine segments to the fruit of the Spirit, and yet they're one in Him. These qualities are produced in the believer by the Holy Spirit when one is fully yielded. There are some that attempt by their own self-efforts, to put on these qualities as a veneer, to be sweet, suave, and gentle, just a veneer, but let tribulations and trials come their way, then their veneer becomes shot full of holes and perforated, and the true character of their unregenerated heart becomes immediately unveiled. I've been in their presence. I've seen... When things go wrong, how the veneer just melts away. True Christian character is produced in the believer by the Holy Spirit, the indwelling Holy Spirit, and not by the believer or by the self-efforts of his own works. You can never produce these works or the fruit of the Holy Spirit by your own effort or the turning over of a new page, or by boundless or numberless resolution. Listen, it's Christ in you, the Holy Spirit in you, and he desires to take full and complete charge of your earthly tabernacle. John 7, I'll only just start, I'm only halfway to first base. On the seventh chapter of the Gospel of John 38th and 39th, Verses, he that believeth on me, now notice the wording, he that believeth on me, as the scriptures hath said, out of his innermost parts shall flow rivers of living water. But this he spake of the Spirit, which they that believed on him should receive, for the Holy Spirit was not yet given. Listen. Out of the innermost part, you can't produce it. It'll flow. God empowered rivers of water, living water. And this old world dying of sin thirst certainly needs the water of life. And you and I who are vessels should carry that flowing living water to the very last possible soul. Again in the 16th chapter of the Gospel of John, the Holy Spirit being in you will teach you. I have yet many things to say unto you, the Lord said at the Last Supper, 
but ye cannot bear them now. Howbeit when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things uh, to come. All he shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. And all things that the Father hath are mine. Therefore said I, that he shall take of mine and will show them unto you. And listen, First John 2.27, I love it. I've turned to it many, many times. You'll find these words in that marvelous chapter. It is. But the anointing which we have received of him abideth in you, and ye need not that any man teach you, but as the same anointing teaches you of all things, and is truth and is no lie, and even as it is taught you, ye shall abide in him. I like those words. Ye need that no man teach you. And I've seen some of the most illiterate, far as this world's education is concerned, receive Christ as personal Savior, yield and present their bodies as living sacrifice, and become saturated with this word from Genesis to Revelation. And, beloved, I love to sit at their feet and have them unfold the things that God has shown them through the Holy Spirit. How he loves to take the weak things and the foolish thing to confound the why. I'll have to close with this. I don't know where the time has gone. Fourteenth chapter of the eighth or fourteenth verse of the eighth of Romans. Listen. For as many as are led and when you are led by someone you have delegated or presented your body, soul, and spirit into his keeping. And Christ is our shepherd. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. And then the 16th verse. Here's the test. The Spirit himself beareth witness with our spirit that we are sons or children of God. And to you outside of Christ Jesus, dead in trespasses and sin, alienated and cut off from the life that's in Christ, you have no witness in your heart that you've passed from death unto life. But I say on the authority of God's word today, if you'll believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and receive him into your heart as your as your personal Savior, the Holy Spirit will come in. And the moment that he comes in, you'll pass from death unto life. And there comes that witnessing, that assurance. I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he's able to keep that which I have committed. And you can pass from death unto life and leave the radio and leave this building. A new creation in Christ Jesus, but that's just one step. The next step is present your body as a living sacrifice and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Friends outside of Christ, out in the radio audience, give your heart to him to now and say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner, and save me for Christ's sake. And let the Holy Spirit of God come and indwell your heart. While our heads are bowed in this splendid visible audience today, in the quietness of the closing moments of the old-fashioned revival hour, how many will put your hands up and say, pray for me. I need Christ as my personal Savior. Please pray for me. I want to accept him today. God bless you. Is there another hand to go up in this audience here? Say by the uplifted hand, Brother Fuller, pray for me. I need Christ. God bless you. I need Christ as my personal Savior, and I want you to pray for me. God bless you back there. There's another one here on the lower floor of the auditorium in Long Beach. God bless you. Anyone, any place? God bless you. God bless you. God bless you over here. Souls, hands going up all over. Continue in prayer. 
This is Charles E. Fuller bidding you goodbye and God's richest blessing upon you. Amen.